Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Next Brave Thing. I'm your host, Ella Hooper, and today I'm joined by the beautiful Julia Gentry. Thank you for joining me today. Glad to be here. So excited. So some of you will know um, Julia's mom, Nora Abel. She came on my podcast, and we really dug into limiting beliefs. And I was really introduced to you through your mom, which is amazing. So you are a author, a life coach, a pastor, a mom of five, a wife. Am I missing any any <laughs> any title there? <laughs> I think those are great. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> great. Well, I was first introduced to your work because I have done a lot of personal coaching myself, but it was the first time your mom was leading one of your programs um, uh, through your book, Dream I Dare You. And it was the first time I'd been a part of group coaching where the I actually felt really supported by your curriculum because because I think sometimes curriculum can take you to a certain level, but there was something about your work that really took it deep. So Julia's book is called Dream I Dare You. Initially, when I got the book, it sort of sat on the shelf, not because of you, Julia, but because <laughs> of the stigma around the word dreaming. And so I don't know if you find that a lot is that when, especially I'm 35, so dreaming is different to when I was 18. And so do you find that a lot with people's approach to your work and dreaming? Yeah, Ella, I mean, that's why I didn't want to write the book. I mean, that was my whole <laughs> approach, you know, like I, I felt very God led, you know, in writing this book. And so when, when I, the title landed, it was not my idea. It was not, that was not a topic I was ready to talk about. I mean, I'm a very practical, tactical girl. Um, and so it was really challenging for me. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, it's like, I think we all, we all have visions, dreams, goals, right? Fill in the blank. And at some level, what you start to realize is once you start to chase those enough, you start to realize that it's actually not about the vision or the dream or the goal. It's about who you become on the way. And so for me, like yes. I li I had to live this out in order to be able to share this message. And so that word dream for me, I mean, it had to flip flop me and my whole psyche around it. I had to wade the waters of my own limiting beliefs that I didn't even know that I had. I mean, it was one of those that I like, it blew my mind and I had to really readjust my heart. And so when people struggle with that word or the curriculum or the life group or whatever it is right in the gate, it's like, I'm like, I get it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I, yeah, totally. it's, the, it's, it's not what you think it is, but it's also why people are not getting the results that they could be getting. And so uh, that's why, I mean, right out of the gate, the, the book is an invitation to kind of rethink this whole concept of like, what is dreaming and what is it not? Um, and yeah. so as, if, if people read that first chapter, they see this is not, this is not a normal dreaming book. And then the rest yeah. is history. And that's what it was for me. I think I got a couple of pages in and you started defining, like you um, created your own definition of dreaming and it was, especially because I've done a lot of work around neuroplasticity and mm -hmm. um, going deep into my subconscious belief system. And so when you started talking about dreaming your definition, and I wish I had the book with me, but I'm in Australia, I so it. I don't have the, yeah, yeah, it. show the people. <laughs> yeah. So but your definition of dreaming was about going so deep in mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. and in sort of going into alignment with from heaven to earth mm -hmm. perspective where there's no lack. And yeah. so uh, I think initially out of the gate, I was such a dreamer, but then disappointment happened and I got so connected to worldly realities around lack that it created so much disappointment um, that changed the way I saw dreaming. So I think that's why there was resistance for me. Um, but what I love about your book is it's like eating steak. And I think a lot of people, um, when they mm -hmm. are going on a healing journey, there isn't a lot of parameters of like, I'm actually going to be like a midwife and help you through this dreaming process and go ahead of you. And that's what you, that's what you're like is like a midwife of like, I'm not going to have your baby for you, but I'll help deliver that child for you. So, it's so, I love that you're saying this. So Ella, it's why. 
It's why moms run for me at the playground. I mean, they see me coming and they're like, dude, this girl doesn't like talking about the weather or really, she's going to ask, how's your heart? And she's going to mean it. And like, yeah, it is. I mean, but for me, I think that this is why this message was so needed um, is because, you know, Mark Twain says, it's not what we know that hurts us. It's what we think we know that just isn't so. And there's a lot out there around dreaming. There's a lot of books. There's tons of vision planning. I mean, we've all been there. We've done that. And generally the number one reason that we aren't seeing our dreams manifested is because of that pain of disappointment, right? I've had a dream once and it didn't come true, or I've held on to that dream for a decade and I haven't seen it, or I prayed and God answered their prayer, but not mine. And so what we do is we completely shut off our hearts, but that doesn't mean that God has shut off his portal of abundance, right? It, that this has nothing to do with God. This has everything to do with our hearts. And so mm. for me, this book was really about the framework to prepare someone to dream again with God. It's not a book to at the end, you're be like, these are my dreams and let's create this strategic plan. It, it's going to prepare your mind, your heart, your spirit, your soul so that you can dream in alignment. And so that you yeah. can actually come back doing the things that you were born to do and the way that you were with the right mind, the right heart, right? The right dream set, you know, these sets are important. And so mm. it's actually a book that's supposed to guide someone back to the place that they're really ready to do that again. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're seeing time and time again in people's lives. And that's so that. cool. And even just watching my group going through it and watching mm -hmm. us, well, we form such a, a bond, like, just from doing the work because you share so vulnerably your story and it's so beautiful because I think in I love how it's designed for accountability and connection and I mean they're to my to this day are such my support system <laughs> it's so amazing so cool. um, that you know it came from this book and this mm -hmm. this uh, journey for you but tell us like where this all began because yeah. it comes from somewhere awesome. like pre-book um, yeah. yeah. Tell us about how this all came about. Yeah. I mean, for, for me, it was my husband and I, we were at a point in our lives that we call it our midlife awakening, <laughs> you know, what most people would call it a midlife crisis. And for us, we had come out of a really interesting season where we, we started our first business really, I was very young. I was 21 years old. Um, and we hit the market spot on, we were doing short sales back in 2008. I mean, we, we hit the market spot on. And so we did very well, very fast only to land $100,000 in debt living in my mom's basement. So when I say that we kind of hit the top, making a ton of money doing like, I mean, we just, we really felt like we were living the dream. And then all of a sudden to land that much in debt a couple of years later was my first step into, oh man, maybe there's more to making money than just making money and more to business than just the techniques. And so that's when I really started doing my work around mindset principles, right? And just diving deep into the power of the mind and neuroplasticity and just like how the mind actually works. Um, that was a fascinating journey for me because again, growing up in the church, I, I know the word of God. And I think sometimes what can happen in a church culture is that we also leave out the very physical, practical parts of what makes us human, right? And how that interacts with the spiritual side of things, right? Even though we're spiritual beings, we're having a very physical experience. And so in my journey, I wasn't actually really taught some of those things. And so that was the next phase for us that really, I think, supported us in getting out of debt, right? We, we found our next American dream again. You know, we had the house and the cars and the 2.5 kids. And so at that point, to be totally honest, Ella, like we had climbed the ladder that most people wanted to climb again. And it wasn't easy, but, you know, we did hard things. And but we still found ourselves crawling into bed every night saying, God, is there something more? Because now here we, we've done all the things that people say you should do to be happy. We've quote unquote mastered our minds and, and yet our souls just really felt unfulfilled. And so we did what most people don't, but we just decided to sell everything. And we're like, let's just, let's go on an adventure and let's do the last thing on our, right. Our vision board. And so for my husband, this was when, you know, he was living his dream. I mean, if you were to sit down, him and I had very, <laughs> very different experiences of this RV travel because he loved it and he, his soul was alive and, um, we had three kids under the age of five. So for me, going to a new place every other day in a way like I, that I couldn't control and three kids and like I realized that I was a control freak and that I mm. actually liked my routine and that if there was a box and like I wanted to control that box and the narrative and like it really revealed to me that I think I have some problems that I've not dealt with. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, and I had done like all my daddy issues and like, I'd gone to therapy sure. and counseling and did all the Tony Robbins. And, but I was like, man, what are these really deep seated issues that now like I'm living the dream, but yet emotionally 
I am mm. not connected in a way that I'm would say that I'm living alive. And so that really started my journey as to what the book is now of like, I had to lean in. And this is the same time that I felt very, very motivated to write this book. It was after I kid, but I watched The Greatest Showman, which I swear changed my life. And it was a vision. It was an open eyed vision that I got around a world that just felt very similar to me of like, I'm here, but I'm not living. You know, I'm, I am shuffling my feet, going through the motions of life, but I'm not connected and I'm not, I'm not. I, you know, I'm the glory of God is not like a well in the live in my life. And so it was there that I personally just leaned in for my own sanity. Um, and it's turned into a book and a, a community and a movement and a conference. And, you know, it's really created just the framework for so many people to start living fully and freely and dreaming with God again. Wow. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. I like, love we've hit on it a little bit this idea around abundance mm -hmm. and especially like for me I think a huge inhibitor to dreaming was I'll never like I, I remember feeling before I moved to America I'll never have enough money to pursue my dreams mm -hmm. and um you know I can imagine going you know in, into debt can be very triggering and um and so tell me a little bit about your philosophy around abundance, because it's a huge component in the book. Um, yeah. Like, tell me what you think about living abundance is, what that yeah, looks like. Yeah. I mean, um, I wish that I could tell you, Ella, that I knew what abundance was as we rebuilt our lives. And even as I wrote this book and to be totally honest, I don't think that I knew, I think it's really been in these last couple of years that I've really leaned in to understand what abundance is. If we look at, we look at Maslow's hierarchy, which very religious people would be like, wow, that is not a real, well, but it's a, it's an incredible map of how we live as people, right? Maslow was a man who charted out the human condition and he put it on paper in a way that you're like, that explains why nobody quote unquote, actualizes. Why? Why? Because mm -hmm. I'm so committed to my safety, my security, my stability. And if people love me and if I belong and if I'm actually successful, that I never actualize, which you and I know yes. that we would call that heaven on earth. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it could be worldly terms and very like biblical context. You just didn't use that. And so what can happen is that I'm so focused on the bottom of sa safety, security, stability, that I can't even wrap my head around heaven on earth. And yet especially if you're a believer, we're supposed to be living from heaven on earth to <laughs> this reality. But what happens is we, there's life and, and trauma and we aren't safe or we're not secure as we grow up. And so we kind of build this, you know, this narrative. And I, I say all that for some context is because I think that when I was, when I was getting out of debt and even as I was leaning into build this book, I mean, I was really into probably that willpower zone which is not scary, yeah. not abundance, right? Willpower is that self-reliance of, I can do this. And who said that? I mean, okay, some level for people who need to get out of bed today, you can do this. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. I think willpower has its place. I think willpower can get us out of bed in the morning. I think that willpower can get you going, but willpower is not, you're not getting out of the boat and walking toward Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm you're not going to bring heaven to earth. You, you can do earth well, but so for me, Ella, my first shift was probably into willpower and I started to push and I pushed well for many years. I mean, I, I we pushed to see and we did. And, but what I've learned about abundance is abundance is a pull. Abundance is comprised of grace, stewardship, and honestly authority. And so mm -hmm. abundance in my mind now is the thing that pulls me to continue to dream with God is that it's like, it is such a place of from love, from victory, from complete, from vision, but it takes some time to get to that place. Yeah. My steps are not steps I would suggest is really what I'm saying. My steps were willpower, do hard things. Then it was like, okay, do hard things in character. And then it was like, you know what? I'm just going to say I'm bold. I'm just going to be bold enough to do the things that God's asked me to do. I'm just going to let him do the rest. That's, what she, that's, that's where if I could tell anyone, just skip the other steps. <laughs> mm -hmm. know, like, do what you can do. But true abundance is when we're like, dang, I just know that there is more than enough. And so I'm going to live from this place of more than enough. And I'm going to do what I can do, but I'm just going to let God do the rest.
Yeah, that's so good. I love that you bring up um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs because I think you're right. Like we hang out in our needs for belonging or Mm -hmm. safety, security, finances, the bills paid and those, but then we never actually reach into full actualizations like, you know, and, and something that you write in the book, which is um, a lot of coaching programs I've seen explore limiting beliefs. Yeah. You came up with this concept of limitless vision. Can you Mm -hmm. speak into what is a limitless vision? Yeah. Well, and I think again, you know, limiting beliefs that I write about in the book, it was, I don't want, uh, you know, I'm, I love words. Words are so amazing to me. I think God's word is incredible, but I think that there's just power in words. And so I, I think we, all of us know a lot about limiting beliefs, but most of us don't know what our limiting belief is, right? Or it's a real like off-putting answer. Like I'm not good enough. Like, well, it says everybody, do you know, like, yeah, (laughs) everybody could say that. And, and so I look at purpose or this limitless vision is that God created each one of us specifically to play a certain role in his bigger picture. And so if he's created this limitless vision, which is abundance, right? It's, it's exceedingly abundantly more. And just when you think you're clear, it's bigger, right? That there's also the limiting belief that's very specific to our lives. So there's specificity Mm -hmm. that's super important that most of us don't quite get that specific. And so the limitless vision is the piece that's supposed to open us up to that place of full manifestation, heaven on earth, actualization, dream vision, right? You, anyone, you could fill in the blank with any one of those words. They're all, they're all in that same, but it's to train your mind. You you train your mind. This was as renew your mind every single day to go, okay. It, and if for some of you who are like, no, I'm on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Like I am, I am not safe. I am not secure. I don't have enough. Then your first step is saying, well, if I did, if mm-hmm. I lived in a world of abundance, right? Because sometimes we try to mantra our way through this, like I'm bold and I'm beautiful, but internally your limiting beliefs, you're like, no, you're not. I don't believe that. Right. And so we're like mantra in our way through life and we're not actually developing rooted truths within us. And mm. so where I started, Ella, is I started to say, okay. If I lived in a world where I could create uninhibitedly because I was loved unconditionally, what would I do? That's my vision. So my vision is something that I never had. I was a little girl. Mm. My world got rocked. My, my family was torn apart. I learned to control and it worked. And so creating uninhibitedly did not come normal. It was natural. God gave it to me to do, but I learned fast and hard to not do that. Right. So when I landed on my vision, it actually brought a lot of pain for many years. My vision was very hard to wrap my head and my heart around. And I Mm. had to, for you, when I say this years, I mean it. If I lived in a world where I could create uninhibitedly because I was loved unconditionally, what would I do? And Mm -hmm. it started to create neural pathways. It started to create healing in my heart. It started to create some dream sets. It started to go, well, okay, for the sake of the exercise, I would write. Okay, what would you write? This book. Right? Like that was the book today. The impact today was a byproduct of me just slowly starting to get there to where now it is the world I live in. Mm. It is why we keep doing what we do. It is how we take huge steps of faith. Is that when people are like, yeah, but there's not enough. It's like, I don't live in that world. I don't. Yeah. That's not the piece of heaven that I want to create. And that's not the world that I live in, but it took right. That habitual practice. It took pattern interrupts. It took, it took remapping my brain. It took creating a safe place for my heart to understand what that means. It meant getting rooted in scripture. It meant practicing awkward until awesome. I mean, it just, so the limitless vision is a way to actually say, okay, we can't keep, we can't keep creating our future based on our past, but that's what we do. Right. I look Mm -hmm. at my past and I throw it on my future or I look at my present circumstances and I throw it. I can't do it because there's not enough money. Well, there you go. Like, then don't be mad tomorrow if it looks like today. (laughs) Do you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I could never have that because I didn't have enough growing up. Okay. Well, then don't be mad tomorrow if it looks like yesterday. Yeah. What we need is I actually need a vision for what's possible what's prophetic, what's a dream for my life. And then I have to learn how to start making decisions based upon where I'm going, not where I'm actually at. That's so good. It's huge. Yeah. It's simple. I mean, again, it's simple, but it's really stupid hard. <laughs> like- well, yeah. But I loved <laughs> that you created that sim- simplicity in your work because um, the way that the work is set up, you actually do a few weeks on li- really honing in on what your limiting belief is. Mm-hmm. And what was cool is in the book, you have like a ripple effect of how that limit, that mm-hmm. limiting belief is showing up. And it's actually oh. like, 
so enlightening when you realize, Mm -hmm. wow, that limiting belief that I created when I was a little girl is affecting my finances that way, Mm -hmm. my relationships that way, my relationship with my body that way. Mm -hmm. It's like filtering through all those things. And then what's beautiful in doing the work is um, you start really uh, crafting your limitless vision, which is what you're talking about. And I know for me, like, and even talking with people, being a coach myself, is people are looking for the outside thing to fix an internal thing. So yes. people will go, I want to become a Hollywood executive. I want to become a New York Times bestseller or own a business or whatever. And it's just so like general yes. that it's like, you need to actually get really connected with your heart about what is like, you know, makes you come alive. And I remember when I started crafting my limitless vision, Mm -hmm. then we took it through the ripple effect of what would it look like in my family finances Mm -hmm. if I lived that way or my relationships if I lived that way. And because I'm in actually quite a big waiting season, sometimes the things that I've battled with is like, when this comes through, then I'll feel like this. Mm -hmm. When Mm -hmm. this happens, then I'll feel like this. But what the limitless vision created for me is I remember when we like nailed it, And, um, and it was like living in a joy, like living in a place where everyone is fully loved, free to express themselves, joyful collaboration, creating uninhibitedly. I think I stole that from you. Um, but it was like this like place. And then I went into my job where I was teaching a class and the whole, because I was like posturing that in my heart and meditating on that. I literally manifested that experience in front of me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, oh, this limitless vision isn't far off and I have to do X, Y, and Z and really rumble through and work through my limiting beliefs. It was like just a heart posture of like, I'm actually going to approach today. Like yeah. we're all fully loved. We're living yeah. joyfully collaborating, yeah. creating uninhibitedly. And that's what manifested. And it was a sweet moment of like, I'm made for that moment. Yeah. So then you start being on the lookout for it. So that's why I love your work. Like it's mm-hmm. everyone should do it. <laughs> it's like so cool. But I want to dig into something that because I know that control has been a thing for me, but it's manifested in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what did the journey going from like controlling to creating uninhibitedly because that's a lack of uninhibited is like all that self-protection is gone. So tell Mm -hmm. me that, that road, that journey. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you the shortest answer that took, felt like it took forever. And it did. I mean, this one was probably one of the greatest um, ones to let go of. And I think it has to, it really boils down to, it was an identity thing. So what happens with our protective mechanisms is the fact when I practice it enough, I become it. So I actually, over time, don't think that I'm controlling. I think I'm a controller. I don't think I'm avoiding. I think I'm an avoider. I don't think I'm just procrastinating. I'm a procrastinator. It goes from a verb to a noun. (laughs) You know, so what happens is now my behavior starts to create my identity as opposed to my identity creating my behavior. And that's the world we're living in right now is that because I've been behaving like this or I feel this way, that's who I am. That's not true. That might be fact, but truth and fact are two totally different things. And Mm. so for me, I think I was willpowering myself to not be controlling for a long time, but I saw myself as a controller because I had years of evidence, right? And then it felt so normal to do, and it felt so risky to not do it that I wish that I had just, right? I think we all have to go through them head to heart. But what I know now about this is that your behavior does not dictate your identity. It's your identity that should be dictating your behavior, right? So good. And so back to that willpower, I was willpowering myself through don't be controlling. Don't be controlling. You're like, oh my gosh, anything I'm resisting, it's like, it's just getting, (laughs) you know, like, no, what I need to be doing is I actually just need to be double doubling down on who I am right? It's in our surrendered lives that we glorify God. We resist the enemy. We resist the lies, but we actually need to surrender. And so the biggest transformation happened. It was this gradually, gradually, suddenly, and it's still something that I still have to hold the line on Ella. So when the controller pops up, I still have to go, Oh no, 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 no. That's not who you are. So it's not that it's a one and done, but for me, it was this gradually, gradually, suddenly as actually seeing myself of, Oh, I am a creative. I I actually Mm. am free. I, that is who I am. And that took a lot of time 
And that is something that most days comes more natural, but it's times that I still have to like combat mm. the controller when she pops up. And I generally yeah. say to her, I know this sounds crazy, but I'll be like, yo, dude, what are, what are you afraid of right now? Cause that's what control mm. is. Control is built in fear. So what is it that you're trying to yeah. say? Here? And it always goes back to my limiting belief. It always goes back to right. Being, being immune to someone else's problem. Now I'm going to have to hold the problem that you're creating here. So let me control this whole room, right? So that I can avoid pain. And when you understand mm -hmm. that now, what used to take you a decade could take you 10 minutes. Yes. Right? You're like, you see it in 10 minutes. So it's not that you're ever done doing the work. It's that you just actually can do it faster. You can call mm -hmm. it what it is. You can move through it. You can bind and loose. You can, I mean, there's just, there's so many things that you just, you just do quicker and more aware. I, to me, that's profound. That's huge yeah. progress. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. That's so powerful. So tell me about like something that was big for me because I've struggled with procrastination or <laughs> my limiting belief is like around feeling powerless. Um, and so um, like, I can't, I can't, I'm not capable. I'm not like, and it's yeah. funny because I've, I've broken free of so much of that. Like it's sometimes hard for me to fully remember like how, how powerless I did feel and how avoidant, mm -hmm. like I was so avoidant. And mm -hmm. so just felt a lot of helplessness. And, um, but a huge thing for me is especially doing the coaching and Nora would call me out on it. Like, she'd be like, you're in your limiting belief. And I'd be like, no, because the facts are, I just had like an insane day at work. <laughs> But it, it would, I would literally go into like shrinking and I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to be this powerful, like a go all small. And then she would say, you need to lift till failure, like lift till failure. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, that's so helpful because guys, when you read the book, Julia has the greatest terminology on like <laughs> how, like what you actually need to do. And I'm like, no, Nora, I need to acclimate. I need to acclimate. <laughs> And I'm like, and she's like, no, you need to live till failure. <laughs> and so tell me about this concept of lifting till failure. Cause right. I think it's something that a lot of us need on the road to transformation because we have so much resistance to change. Oh, well, I mean, I think if we're not careful, we just, we're just going to talk like general terms right now, but we just live in a world right now that they don't encourage people doing hard things, right? We just, we live in a world that it looks like it comes easy. It doesn't. It, it looks like, or it should come easy. And so what happens is we start to find some resistance and we immediately think God's doing something. I did something wrong. And we just tap out, right? We just, we don't see the pressure as a privilege. We don't see it as an opportunity. You know, we don't tend to lean in, we tend to tap out. And so for me, you know, this was a huge, it was just working out, right? It was when I realized my husband so beautifully when in the RV phase of our lives, I decided to get strong, right? And so he said to me in passing, are you lifting till failure? And I was so pissed off. You know, the, the idea of like the truth will piss you off before it'll set you free. Like I was so mad. And then I remember being like, what the heck did he just, <laughs> like, what? And it was one of those moments that like my soul was like, oh, yeah, like there was, you know, those moments when you're just like the lion, I love Brandon Lake song, like come on my soul, like don't get shy on me of the lift to failure concept is the same as if I were to hit the gym, you can go to the gym and work out and never get stronger, right? Because I'm, I'm just there, right? Burning calories or whatever it is. But the only way that I am actually going to grow strength by doing more than I think I can do to the point of failure, mm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like, my husband says all the time, but I don't even start counting until it burns. Yet yeah, you find your burn and then you got to do a couple of more, a couple more. I'm not saying do hard just to do hard. I'm saying to pick your heart yeah. very strategically, right? And generally, if I'm being bold and I'm doing the next brave thing that God's asked me to do or that like that's the dream, that's the vulnerable thing, that would be your heart. It's not people pleasing or avoidance. All that is hard too. So first I need to pick the right kind of hard. And then when I do, I need to realize that actually the pressure is a privilege. It's not there to break me. It's there to make me. And it's what it's doing is it's developing me to the point that it's stretching me to the point of where I'm going right? But I'm, I'm going to hold it. I'm going to do a few more because it's like, I'm training my body, right? To go further than I think, than I think I can go to the point of then it's going to break itself down in order to build itself back up. Bible talks mm -hmm. about this all throughout the, I mean, everywhere you'll find this interlace, but it's a simple term for us, even at home now that I'll say to my husband, how was your day? And he'll just have to look at me and go, I lifted till failure. 
And we just know that those days mm-hmm. you're like, dang, I got my butt kicked or I had to confront the lie everywhere I went. Or yeah, I made more calls today than I really wanted to, but it's right. It's helping me. It's developing me, right. I'm persevering through it. And so I think if those terms, but they just make sense, you know? So it's one of those yes. that you're like, okay, like this makes sense to me. And if I could do it in the gym, I can do it emotionally. I can do it spiritually. I can do it relationally. And so, yeah. Yeah. We, that's we, so we helpful. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I think that like you mentioned, like choose your hard. And I think <laughs> that, you know, often when I meet a client, I'll be like, yep, this d- does take hard work <laughs> and you can feel that but life is already really hard. Yeah. But I think like what it is and why I can't ha- recommend your book more than a more, mm. more, what's the word? <laughs> more than a enough. Lot. Do like, it. A go. lot. Do it a go. lot. Read it. Read it. I love it. it. <laughs> yeah. Read it. Um, only because like, I think that life is hard and we need a roadmap. We actually need people who are further ahead than us that can say, Hey, this is the way, and this is what kind of hard it is. Yeah. And that's why it was helpful. Like having you, your mom be like, you need to live till failure and actually <laughs> learning how to do that. Like, like, or just knowing that that was what I was supposed to do at that moment, I think. And that's the importance of like community and everything mm-hmm. is like, sometimes I'm just trying to solve my own pro- problems in isolation. And yeah. it's like, no, I need someone outside of me to say, this is that moment where you keep lifting, yeah. you know? Well, and I think, I think there's, there's, there's levels of awareness around this, um, this key that is so important because if you're like, well, life is just so hard. Well, when you're doing, when you're connected to the right kind of hard, it's yes. empowering. Right there, yes, your soul that's is alive. So right? good I tell you, like the fire that you're wanting is on the other side of the work that you're avoiding. And so, if yes. you're just reactive in life, that will be hard. But when you choose to be proactive in life, also hard. But when you're also now in your lane, right, limit decision, and you're pursuing the dreams that are in front of you, also hard. By the way, just as equally as hard as not, right? It's just the right kind of hard. Now you start to go. This is hard, but my soul is alive. That's a big difference, yes. right? And so now what we're looking at is that, that the right kind of hard will also be sustainable, right? Because it's somewhere between, I'm also not going to go to the gym 24-7, seven, seven days a week and burn out on lifting till failure. I have to know that there's yeah. times to failure, good. times to acclimate, times to rest, right? And so part yeah, of this is understanding so all the tools that are in the book, but I think that the journey for most people is most people just need to be doing the right hard things, right? We just need to shift yes. in there. And then to your point, once I'm doing that, then we do need a community that, and this, everything changed in my marriage. I kid you not, because I probably was an enabler to my husband. I wanted him to be happy, probably for my own self-preserving, right? All of us can do that. And I just thought, I just want him to be happy. And the day that I realized I'm not here to make my husband happy, I'm here to, to be alongside him, to be the best version of him, everything changed. And that mm. was the moment that even in my marriage, I was like, I'll get down and do push-ups with him. Right. I'm not, Mm -hmm. I will get down and I will lift till failure with my community. And when my team is doing hard things, we will do them together. And when my kids do hard things, I'm like, we're doing, we're going to do hard things together. And so Mm. that is priceless. What you're talking about is one, deciding to do the right kind of hard in life is step one. Then being in community with people who are like, I'll do hard with you. Like mm-hmm. people don't do that. Friends do. I just had a hard conversation with a girlfriend today that she's like, nobody has these kind of conversations with me. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like we should, we should be doing this. And yes. So, yeah. I mean, and that's why my dream coaching group, like they're amazing because like, yeah, even before I left to come back to Australia, one of the girls is like, that feels like going backwards. Like I just said something and I thought I was surrendering and she's like, no, 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 no. Like, cause sometimes we're like doing the wrong thing, yeah, like yeah. the right thing at the wrong time. Totally. And so, so we yeah. need community to be like, no, 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 no Ella. Like no. That's, well, that's, you're that's going so fun about this. I mean, this is like, this book becomes a language. I mean, yes. it really does. It becomes a language. It's a, it's the culture. It's DNA. I mean, my kids, we talk, this is our language. This is my husband and language. This I is love my it. Company. This is our language. So yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. It's so good. It's so powerful. Um, So I guess like, as far as like courage, because this podcast is called The Next Brave Thing, I think mm-hmm. oh, one thing I will say about avoidance, and I love because I was noticing like the when you avoid, that's hard. 
mm. because of yeah. like all all the all the pain that creates around an anxiety it creates. Yeah. But one thing I will say is like when I started writing down and to your point of like um yeah, or everything happens on the work that you're avoiding. Like oh, really? once you take action on the thing that you're avoiding, like things will happen. And that's so true in my own life. Like I now yeah. get excited about like, okay, how can I create peace in my world? What am I avoiding? And yeah. let's go see what we manifest yeah. from this. Because so I will literally have things come through mm-hmm. now when I just address the thing that I'm avoiding. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just <laughs> manifested this good experience because I decided to show up and not hide yeah. in my life. Which really, you know, that word is so interesting depending on, you know, your your background. and But all that word manifest means is to show, means to display, you know? Yeah. And so I think that that's the power of that word is that we just get to yes. show and display our vision. That's, yeah. that's what the point of life is. And so, yeah, yeah I think that's really powerful yeah. that you're seeing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's definitely... Yeah, it's definitely powerful when you see things actualize. Mm-hmm. I guess I didn't know I didn't know manifestation actually meant to show, but yeah, I guess it means, it means to actualize. It means to show. It means to display. So when people, you know, even in the in the church space, they go, "Oh, that word is." It's not sure. a yeah. It could be very. It could be again. Anything can be manipulated, right? But all right. it means, even when it says manifest your kingdom come on earth as mm-hmm. in heaven, that's actually meaning show and display. Who? Yeah. How is that done? through our lives, right? The glory of yeah. God is manifest through a man and a woman who is fully alive. We, we show the glory of God. We show heaven on earth by the way that we live our lives. And so that also proves why a dream is not about the thing. It's about who you become because it's who you're becoming. Mm. That is actually what we're all wanting. Think about it. I want a nice car. Why? Cause I will feel happy. Okay. Well, be, like that's already in you. It, yes. If I can become a happy person, then I can have a car and it doesn't have me become what I want. And so then when I get it, it doesn't have me. That's mm-hmm. a joy filled person. Right. And so I think yeah. when you, when you learn that it just, it's, there's more flow to the process. Yes. And you're reminding me of what Proverbs says of as a man thinks in his heart. So he is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, so interesting. Like we really do manifest what's from our identity, what we think yeah. about ourselves 100%. really affects like, yeah, what we see yeah. happening I mean, in our look world. At, look at Jesus' prayer. Prayer was not something you did. Prayer was lifestyle for him. So I think the, the profoundness of why the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, is with, they might as well have said, like, teach us also how to live, right? And yes. he says, he begins it with our heavenly father dwelling in the heavenly realms. That's the top of Maslow's hierarchy. Maslow, you didn't actually come up with that, <laughs> right? That's like right. actually putting my eyes at the top is, at the top is, at the top place, right? Mm-hmm. Your kingdom. And then may the glory of your name be the center in which my life turns. There's my focal point. Manifest yes. from what perspective? That one, right? What am I creating from? Mm-hmm. Done, finished, complete vision, dreams. Manifest that. Show and display heaven on earth. Give me my mm-hmm. daily bread. Give me everything I need today to do that. That's not just money or food. That's like literally being resourced from heaven in such a way that we're not trying to get it all done tomorrow or yesterday, yeah. but every day. So the prayer is really interesting to me because he's actually walking you back down this ladder of Maslow's hierarchy to basically meet every single need that we could have, but it come, our starting point is different. Mm, so good. You see what I'm saying? We're not looking yeah. from the bottom up or looking from the top down. Mm-hmm. That's so powerful and so empowering. Like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. So you're in the middle of doing your next brave thing. And so tell us about what you're up to. I, our next brave thing again, Ella, had you asked me five years ago that I would be doing what we're doing now, I would have said, heck no. And for those people who have followed my journey, even when I wrote the book, I was not writing it for the church. I've always been a marketplace ministry, more of a growth coach, very practically, tactically helping people. And so when God asked me to write it for the church, that was a hard pass. Like, I was like, no, I think I even said, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I love you, Jesus, but no, you got the wrong girl. Um, but here we are five years later and our next brave yes is I'm going to pastor an online church. We launch a church Amazing. called Dream Church. Um, and our heartbeat is really just to have a global reach with a local impact. We believe in really teaching people how to be the church. I think it's gotten really easy for us to get away from doing that because we go to church or we watch church or... And we just really feel like our lane to occupy is to um, unite believers all across the world and to commission them 
um, from the comfort of their own home and then teaching them how to go um, and to display, manifest the glory of God. So we, we're, we're building a church. We're building oh, the church. That. <laughs> That's amazing. And so tell me the moment that you realize this is, this is what we're supposed to do. What was that moment? <laughs> I think my life, my life is like God's greatest setup. He's like, here angels, we're going to have to do this backwards. Cause she's going to say no, the whole, I mean, ask my mom. She, I was the kid that she's like, Hey, eat your broccoli. I was like, no. Then she'd be like, fine, I don't care. Don't eat your broccoli. And I'd be like, okay, great. Like, that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. But for me, it was at another point that we were, I found myself pushing again. I don't know that I was super conscious of it because again, right, I've done all the work and you do all the things and I was very well aware. And But I was pushing really hard um, to build my brand the last couple of years. And to be totally honest, Ella, I never wanted to build my brand. I've never wanted my name on anything. When my team came to me and said, we need to call the Dream Factory, the Julia Gentry, I was like, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And it, I thought it was my limiting belief. My limiting belief has created a hider, right, to where I, I tend to hide. And so I thought it was going to be the way to move through that. And so we put, I pushed really hard and I really thought that I was showing up on the front lines and going to push through that. And I realized that I don't want to build my business. I want to build his kingdom. And so I was sitting with him because things weren't going as bad, as good as they should, though we were all pushing super hard. And so I was asking big questions like, God, what do you want me to do next? Cause this is not sustainable. And I heard him clearly say to me, um, and I've heard him clearly a handful of times. I'm more of a knower. So when he speaks, like, mm -hmm. it's like, I'm listening. And he said, um, your order's wrong. And I was like, my order? <laughs> what? <laughs> and he said, um, you're building the wrong thing. He said, you're building your business. I want you to build the church. And I was like, I literally sat up in bed and I was like, Ella, it was like the, I went, I can do that. Like it was actually wow. one of those brave moments that you go, your intellect is like, what are you doing? And everything in you is like, I can do that. I mean, and it was within 30 days. We had taken something that we've been building for the last 10 years. I sat with my husband. I sat with my close team. I sat with some of the people like that know me well. And I was like, look, this is the blueprint. This is the framework. I mean, it wow. came fast. And everyone across the board was like, we saw this coming. I was like, what do you mean you saw this coming? What, did you not say something? Like, you know, I was like, what the heck are you talking about? And so it's, yeah, it was this gradually, 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 suddenly, and it was just those moments that you just sit close enough to him and he's always speaking. It's just, you know, do we have the capacity to hear what he's about to say? Yeah. And I think that, oh my gosh, as you're sharing that, I'm like, I live for those God moments, like <laughs> that too. moment where he like speaks and everything makes sense and yes. you don't have to be the biggest person coming up with your next strategy, yeah. like, yeah. oh, takes oh, the pressure it's like, off. Oh, it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. So wow. we're, we're going to build his church globally and um, we're having a great, talk about creating uninhibitedly. We just, there is no strategic plans. There's no Trello boards. Like we are flowing with him. We are literally living on daily bread and it's this, it's a stinking blast. I feel alive. Um, we're watching home churches being developed. I mean, we're launching with home churches right out of the gate and people who are just hungry for the presence in their own home and hungry to really be discipled, you know, in, in who they are in Christ. And so we're just, we really believe that we're going to be pioneering something awesome and that it's accessible mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, yeah. We just, we just want to take his commission literally. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, that's so cool. Yeah. It's really cool. And people, people, we need like a new church experience. And that's yeah. what I'm so, when your mom told me about it, I was like, we just need this. The yeah. world is ready for it. We're so tired yeah. of a formula that's been done for years and mm -hmm. we're ready for something new. And so like I have listeners all around the world. So yay, yay, cool. they, can they, can they tune yes. in from this anywhere? Is, yeah. So we have um, our live streams again, when we say global reach, I mean, we, we are going global. So we, right. There's, there's about three to 4 billion people that have still never heard the name of Jesus. And so for us, we are not playing small. We partnered with pray.com and some really big global ministries, digital ministries. So anyone can watch if you go to our YouTube channel at dream church global, um, or our website, dreamchurchglobal.org slash live. We're live streamed every single Saturday. 
it's three Pacific. So everyone will need to do the math, right? Wherever you're at. Yeah. Um, but our hope is that not only are you watching globally, but our, we don't want you to watch. We want you to be the church. And so Mm -hmm. we've created a whole network within our church for people to actually raise their hands and not only be members of this church, um, but actually home church leaders where you just go, man, I, even if that's two people, you invite two people, we are actually giving them the framework of our gather notes. You know, we, we, it's called ready, gather, go, where people just say, come gather with me. Um, so people, you can invite people of your own home and yeah, and even no matter where you are, you can watch us. Mm -hmm. I love this because I think what you carry is like you bring people in and then you get people into alignment and then they're taking action. Like you have this beautiful ability to come alongside. And so I encourage anyone who's listening, who maybe has never gone to church or never had that experience, like go check this out because I think that we're starved spiritually and you are so prophetic. And I think I noticed the reason why I go to church is because I, well, I mean, there's many reasons, but one of them is actually to get connect with a corporate pulse of what God's doing. And so what you carry is such a beautiful listening ear to the voice of God. And I just know that anyone who comes in and needs to find a church that doesn't feel because I can imagine for some people who's been hurt by the church or oh, there's 100%. been an intim- like there's this intimidation of women walking in a building again. Yeah. And so I think it's so beautiful that that you have launched this and it feels very inviting and we'll definitely make sure that we have all of your websites and details in the show awesome. notes. But in closing, um what do you feel like, is there a charge that you would want to leave or is there anything that you would want wow. these listeners to sort of take away or a charge yeah. you want to leave them yeah. with? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very similar just even to your title. We were using the same word, but I think it's two separate words, but very same charge, which is just do the next bold thing. Bold by my definition is just the willingness to say yes. And so there was something yeah. that happened inside everyone listening to this today of like either that dream of that you could see it even that idea of like, I need to be connected to church again, even though you've had hurt, but like that thing that's like, ah, it's that soul moment where your soul opens up again. That's the next brave thing. That's the next bold thing is just the willingness when this piece of you, your gut, your intuition, your heart, your spirit, man, whatever you want to call that says, we need to do that, do that, right? Like do that. And then don't stop. If you want a full life, if you want a life alive, if you want to be connected and aligned, that's the voice that we need to be listening to. And so I'm, I'm coming in. That's why I'm here with you is like, do the next brave thing, do the next bold Mm. thing, and then don't stop. It's going to be the best life ever. It's not always going to make sense. And we don't care. Like perfection is overrated, awkward until awesome, messy until miracle. Like that's, you know, so that's what I would really say is, is just do the next bold, brave thing and then don't stop. I love that. That's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on my podcast and I'm excited to watch your journey unfold to see where it goes. Cause that's the exciting part. We don't know where it's going to go. We have some uh-huh. ideas. I'm going to come to Australia. But... You stay there long enough. I'm going to come down and come find you there. Yes. Come. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so fun. Oh, well, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thank you.